what gravitational field strength is, and I didn't really quite give you guys enough time to get to these questions, though. Some of you guys already started them, okay? So we are going to come back to these. In fact, I want to do number one with you. Again, for those of you that weren't here, we can get caught up pretty easy. But I do want to focus on this page for now. So what are we, like the third page in? No, fourth page, fifth page. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, all basically the first three pages were um, dealing with the universal law of gravitation, which is this formula right here. You really only need to know this formula and then the one for gravitational field strength, which is that guy right there. Okay, so these are the only two. Whoops, I kind of got that off screen. The, these are the only two formulas that are in um, chapter four. Okay, and it's applying them in a couple of different ways and then understanding uh, a few applications. So, yeah. The practical one, this one emphasized how because the Earth is bulging at the equator, you're further from the equator at zero degrees than you are at 90 when you're at the poles. No, yes. So the acceleration due to gravity is a little stronger at the poles. Um, I'll emphasize that maybe a bit more when we get to another side. What I want to start with, though, is this definition right here. Today I want to talk about something called true versus apparent weight. I think you guys will pick it up really quick because it's just a sort of a vocabulary understanding. And I want to show you the formula for it, okay? So um, let me just add a couple things to this because it's sort of already there. But when I talk about uh, true weight, true weight is the easiest one, okay? It is the gravitational force that's acting on a mass. And I want to add something to this. This is really at a point in space, okay? So you're, you're in... You're at some distance, say, from, the, uh, from a planet even or from a large mass. And you, to calculate true weight, so if I ever say, calculate the true weight, blah, 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 that's just the force due to gravity, mass times whatever g happens to be. And so that's why, that's why, this, that's why I made this little expression here, because that affects little g. Wherever you are in space, then... The, you would calculate what little g would be at that location, and then you just multiply it by the mass done. Okay, so for uh, true weight, that's all you do. Now, there's another definition though that we need to start thinking about, and that's something called apparent weight. Now, this definition is a little abstract. It says apparent weight is the negative of the normal force acting on the mass. And you're like, I'm sorry, what did you say? Negative of the normal force. Um, it does have a symbol W. I just I don't want to stress about that symbol though because I want to show you uh, what it really is. Um, apparent weight. Let's put it over here just as a practical expression. It's basically how heavy you feel um, when you experience. And acceleration okay now I want to I want to um, well I guess I said it in next force let's just say an acceleration so you're experiencing one so if this means that you're actually experiencing a force okay so you're not just you're not just I mean you could be at it you will be at a point in space you always are by the way you can't not be <laughs> if you exist you're at a point in space but the point is, is that you, um, you'd be accelerating for some reason. And so the best way to kind of wrap your head around this is to imagine you in an elevator, but on a scale, a bathroom scale, okay? And why, that, why I put you on a bathroom scale is because, and you'll see this in a video, the scale measures your apparent weight. It measures how heavy you feel as you ride the elevator. So I know there are not a lot of elevators around here, but I'm confident everybody's at least been in one. If you've been to any mall anywhere in Alberta, you're gonna probably ride an elevator. Um, if you go to the hospital and ride that elevator, it's the slowest elevator on the planet. And yeah, it's really slow. But I guess they just don't want people having heart attacks in the elevator. So, but if you're in the elevator, if you can imagine this, um, 
right when the elevator takes off, if it's a fast one, do you feel the same or do you feel lighter or do you feel heavier? What do you think? Okay, oh, someone's saying heavier. Okay, okay. So that I think you're kind of thinking that. And then what happens when you get to the top? Like when the elevator gets to the top and stops, how do you feel for a split second if it's, if it's a fast elevator? You feel a bit lighter, yeah? You kind of feel like you're driving in a car on the Red Rock Road in Waterton and you go really fast over the hill and what happens to your stomach? You're like, woo, -hoo. okay? So what's happening there is your, your um, internal organs actually have inertia. And so when you go over a hill like that really fast, your internal organs actually kind of go up inside your body and your, your brain senses that with a nerve. It's called the vagus nerve, which is hilarious because I think of Las Vegas where you go on thrill rides. But anyway, so that tells your brain that your innards are moving and it makes you feel woozy. That's what, that's what we call butterflies, right? Because inside your stomach, you're like, holy cow, what's going on? Huh? And you're, but, but you're, 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 you're sensing it. Your brain is actually sensing inertia in your, inner, in, in your internal organs. And, but that's why you feel lighter, okay? Um, and, uh, and actually, mathematically, you are, you are experiencing an acceleration upward. So um, I want to just show you, actually, let's just draw it out, and then I'll, I'll let you watch a, a, a short clip of what it actually looks like. So um, let's do this. I, just want, I, left, I left a lot of space here because I want to be able to draw a couple of things. Um, if you are in an elevator <laughs> and you're on a way scale just for fun, Okay, so we're going to put a big box around you because you're in an elevator and you're just standing on a, on a bathroom scale. If that's the case, gravity is always down. So that's never a surprise. If you were to draw a free body diagram, get a nice little center of mass here. Um, oops, let's make this down here. So gravity would be acting down on you, but you would feel a normal force, in this case, coming from the floor of the elevator or from the bathroom scale upwards, okay? You would feel a force, and that would be the normal force, okay? So, it'd be, it, you know, that's not surprising so far. This is really what you've uh, kind of, you can imagine if you're just standing on this bathroom scale in the elevator. So, the point is, if, um, if you're just at rest, if you're just at the bottom of the elevator and you haven't moved yet, then well, it doesn't matter. At any position, you would have a net force, which would be the result of these two forces, okay? Force of gravity down and the normal force up. And if you were at the bottom, then the forces would balance and you would not have a net force on you. So you wouldn't feel weird at all, okay? But the catch here is if, you, if you're accelerating upwards, so if the elevator with, they call it the inertial frame of the elevator, but if the elevator accelerates upwards, well, you don't change gravity, but now the floor of the elevator is pushing harder on you, so you feel a reaction to that, okay? And the reaction to the normal force is your apparent weight, okay? So what we say here, let me write it down here a bit further. Apparent weight, if that's what I'm asking you to, to figure out, um, is the negative of the normal force. Acting on you. And yeah, they tend to use the symbol Omega. Again, I don't want to stress about that because we really don't, I don't see, I don't show you that very much. But this would be your apparent weight would just equal the negative of whatever the normal force is. Okay, so the normal force is up. Like, I don't want you to think that your apparent weight is up. Sorry, sorry, I went too far. Yeah, it, your apparent weight isn't up. Your apparent weight is down, but it's a reaction to the normal force, which is up. Okay, so the floor of the elevator, depending how hard the floor of the elevator pushes on you, um, that's how that would be your apparent weight. So I know. I've heard stories. I've taken volleyball players on tournaments, and some of them will get in the elevator, get to the top floor, and then 
they, they push the button to go down, but what do they do right before the elevator moves? Anyone know? They jump. So if you do that, then by the time you return to the point that you jump from, the elevator is not there anymore. It is moved downwards. So you actually fall farther than the distance that you jumped up and it gives you a rush. But it also jams the elevator and then the hotel people don't like you very much. So anyway, so don't do that. But um, <laughs> apparently there's, there's um, some Olympic sports that have originated in elevators. So anyway, whatever. No, no, there haven't been. But I'm just saying some athletes try and make them happen. So here's the catch, though. If this is, if I ask you to solve for an apparent weight, which we'll do one here in just a second, let me just show you how, how it would play out. Um, the net force is really uh, equal to mass times acceleration. And technically, that's the net acceleration. But the force of gravity is just m times g. And then the normal force, we can't break that down at all. So you have to find that indirectly, which we're going to do. The point is, all you do is solve for Fn, okay, in this scenario. And doing so would look something like this. I'd have to subtract uh, mg from both sides. Let me just flip this guy around so it looks right, or so it reads right to left. So it would be ma minus mg, okay, would be how you'd calculate the normal force. And if you really want to, um, it's actually kind of nice. You can factor out the mass, okay? So the mass is in two entities on the right-hand side of the equation. If you factor that out, you can go mass times A minus G, like that, okay? And then this effectively, now the normal force, of course, would be up, so your parent weight is down. Anyway, if you um, calculate the normal force, then you have the amount of apparent weight is really what you have. Now, there's just a little tiny catch with this one, because if you're tracking this, you're like, Mr. Hardy, well, force to gravity should be down, so it's negative, and you're right, and the normal force should be up, because it's positive. So in this shortcut, and this is really just a shortcut, um, you must remember that G has to be a negative 9.81, okay, especially if we're dealing with Earth, which we're going to. I'm not going to throw this on another planet. So the point is, if this is negative, then you would go, the acceleration would be minus a negative 9.81, which would really be adding it, okay? So uh, we'll see if I can show you that here in just a little bit. Um, okay. So that, that, that's, that's, the, that's just a quick introduction to apparent weight. I want to show you, uh, this is a classic physics experiment. Um, uh, uh, I caught a video of some university students who actually had to do this experiment for their professor, and they actually do a pretty good job of explaining it. So I was gonna let you guys watch them. Uh, if you take, I mean, if we had more elevators around here, I guess we could do it too, because it's not too hard of an experiment. But the catch is, if you want to lose weight or gain weight, all you gotta do is ride the elevator. And you can lose weight and gain weight at the same time. Well, not at the same time, but depending on what part of the ride you're on. So. Let's see if this guy will wake up here. Come on. There we go. I'm oh, go. John Lehman. I'm Eric Monster. I'm Lisa I'm Kelly Smith. So here we go. Weight changes in the elevator. Oh, sorry. Do you got finished? Okay, perfect. We're going to demonstrate the second law, force equals mass times acceleration with an elevator. Mass is absolute, whereas weight is not, because it's dependent on the acceleration of the body. As the elevator begins to go upwards, our acceleration in this inertial frame will be greater than the downward acceleration of the elevator. So when acceleration increases, the weight will increase. When we get to the top of the elevator ride, the elevator will slow down, which means our upwards acceleration will be greater than the inertial frame of the elevator. When acceleration goes down, weight goes down. Kelly is currently on the scale. Um, we're on the second floor and we're going to move up to the third floor and his weight should increase and then decrease. Wait. Okay, so they're going to put it in the camera. So he's weighing about once. Oh, wow. He already jumped up like 195. So he was like 175. He gained like 10 pounds just for a few seconds there. And then look at the top of the elevator. He lost about 10 pounds. Okay, because the scale is showing. We are now going to do the experiment of the elevator change. moving downwards. When it starts to move, it accelerates downwards and his weight will decrease. And then as we reach the floor, it will accelerate upwards as it slows down and his weight will um, increase slightly. 
his weight should decrease and then increase. Okay, so we'll just watch the, again, watch the scale. He should lose about 10 pounds. He does it right there. Okay, so they pause the camera, lost about 10 pounds, gets back to, st to stable while the elevator's forces are balanced, and then there's a force at the bottom, and so he's heavier at the bottom. So we just proved that weight is dependent upon acceleration, and it can be shown in this elevator. Now we're going to head over to another elevator to see if it's true there. Come on. Let's go. Here we are in the old Cabell Hall elevator. Erica's on the scale right now, so as we go upwards, you'll see her weight increase a bit, and then as the elevator slows down as we near the top, uh, her weight will decrease. Okay, so what? She's 150. You ready? As soon as the elevator starts to go up, right there. Okay, so she gained like 10 pounds. Or, well, she didn't, she isn't gaining pounds, but her apparent weight went up by 10 pounds. Erica's and still on the scale, increased. and this time we're going to go in the opposite direction. And as she, as the elevator starts to accelerate downwards, her weight will decrease. But as the elevator slows down and nears, as it nears the bottom, her weight will increase. Ten pounds. Look at that. So actually, that says something about the, the the velocity of these elevators that they're probably about the same. That the rate at which they accelerate is about the same. Because I think everybody's losing and gaining about ten pounds depending on what part of the ride you're in. Okay, based on we the, have proved Newton's second law. So anyway, we also we can pause that there. I just wanted you to see. I wanted you to see what it's what it's actually measuring. So. I know it's kind of a weird thought that why would you put a bathroom scale in an elevator? So if you ever see anybody doing that, you're like, I know what you're doing. <laughs> you're checking your apparent weight. Or anyway, you just want to feel good about yourself. You're like, oh man, I lost 10 pounds. That, that felt good. And then, and then at the top, you're like, uh, or no, wait, I guess it'd be backwards. If you're at the top, you're like, oh, I lost 10 pounds. That felt good. And then when you get to the bottom, oh, I gained it again. Too bad. <laughs> so, um, here, wait, let me pause this. I want to actually, all right. So let's go to the very last question, you guys. That way you don't have to write this all because it's already kind of spelled out for you. So go to the very last question. It's number 15. Um, and I'll maybe draw some stuff on the left here. It's kind of, I like visualizing everything. Uh, so it says here that a student takes a 500 gram mass and he puts it on a spring scale that's calibrated to intensive Newtons. So this is not a bathroom scale but it's a spring scale. It's basically going to act exactly the same though. Um, and he's taking it in, a, in an office tower to see what happens when the elevator goes up and down. So to help you visualize this, I would put a mass like this and it is 500 grams. I'm just going to get that into kilograms right now because we always need to use your mass in kilograms when we're dealing with force. So this guy is, you know, 0.5 kilograms. When it says a spring scale, effectively that just means that it's on a little spring and then that is hooked up to a, like a device that measures force. Okay, kind of like if you're a fisherman and you're, you, know, you, you, hang, you hang a fish on a, on a weigh scale, that's kind of what it's like. But the point is, is that whole apparatus is somehow, um, like maybe it's like just being held by your hand or something, but we'll just maybe put a bar across here or something. So it's in the elevator. So we have, we had, we're hanging this thing in the elevator and the elevator is going to go up and down. At first, well, no, in every case, um, gravity is going to be down on this mass. And uh, we might as well just calculate that right now because we're going to need to do that. Oh, in fact, that's what it says for part A. What does the scale read when it's just hanging in the elevator and the elevator isn't moving? Okay, awesome. Well, then the force of gravity would just be m times g. And so carefully, that's 0. 0.5 times 9.81, which um, should come out to basically, it's like 4.905 newtons. Or I guess we'd have to round that to 4.91. But I wanted, I wanted you to see the whole number before we round it, because it's relevant later in, the, in this series of questions. Now. In this case, the, um, the upwards force that the, um, the mass experiences, it technically is tension. Um, but for our purposes, because I was showing you the, um, 
I was showing you how the apparent weight is actually the negative of the normal force. We can just consider this is equal to the normal force, just so I'm not confusing you too much, okay? But most of you can tell that obviously there's nothing pushing up on the mass. It's actually being pulled upwards by the tension of this spring, and then it's being measured by the spring scale. But um, for our purposes, we can just consider it to be the normal force. Now, yes, of course, though, if the scale, sorry, if the weight is just hanging from it and the elevator is not moving, then those two forces are balanced, okay? There's no net acceleration on the mass. It's just hanging there, okay? Now, part B, just as a progression, when the elevator first starts moving upward, the scale now reads 5.3 newtons. Now, hopefully that starts making sense. You're like, wait a minute, we're moving up? So I'm going to feel this mass is going to feel heavier than it actually is because it's accelerating, and that's what the scale is telling you, okay? So then it says, what is the acceleration of the elevator if that's the case? Well, this is where we have to consider that now we have a net force for sure, and it isn't zero because the, um, the upwards force is greater than the downwards force, okay? So in effect, what, what I guess we are saying here is, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna keep calling this the normal force so it's not confusing, but I have these two forces that are acting on the mass, and the force upwards is 5.3 newtons, but the force downward is a negative 4.905, okay? If that helps you a little bit. I know I'm adding them as vectors, but if you can see they're fighting each other. So, sorry, I'm just gonna come up here a little bit. That just means then that the net force is going to be, um, what did I get here? Uh, oh yeah, 0 0.395 Newtons, okay? Just the difference between those two, right? Um, and I'm using 4.905 just because I'm trying to stay accurate. So, um, so it's 0.395 Newtons up, okay? Would be the net force. But as you remember, net force can also or net force is really broken down into the mass times the net acceleration, and it does want the net acceleration. It wants to know what's the rate at which the ele elevator is accelerating upwards. So I just have to divide that by the mass, which is 0.5 kilograms. And sorry, I'm kind of jamming this in here. Um, so it looks to me like the net acceleration is going to be 0.79 meters per second squared, and that's going to be up. Okay, so. Again, I'm hoping that you're just seeing for any time you're dealing with apparent weight, you just have two forces, the force of gravity and technically the normal force up. And if which one's greater, if the normal force up is greater, you're going to feel heavier. Okay, you're going to experience what's called this apparent weight. So that would be, um, and this is again when the elevator first starts moving upward. So just right from the net floor as it starts to go up. You are going to accelerate first to, and you'll feel a bit heavier just for whatever a few seconds. But keep going with the question. Part C says, partway to the top floor, the scale accurately reads 4.905. So this spring scale reads 4.905. What would the acceleration be at that instant? What does that actually tell you? Okay, yeah, Luna's doing this. Yeah, zero, right? Because the... Um, if the scale matches the force of gravity, that means the forces are balanced. And that is why when you're, you know, once you get moving in an elevator, you don't feel heavier after that because the forces balance at that point. So now you just feel like you would as if you were standing, if you were just standing still in the elevator at the bottom. Same, same experience, right? So yeah, acceleration here, zero meters per second squared. Okay, because the net force is equal to zero, if you really want to say that, okay? So that's part way to the top floor. And then we keep going near the top floor. And now the scale reads 4.6. Hmm. So if the scale is reading 4.6, I think you guys are starting to see this. Now that means it's reading less than what it actually weighs. And so it feels, the mass in a sense, feels lighter than it actually is. So what would the acceleration be here? Same. Uh, same thought process, um, we would go, um, actually, we could use the abbreviation now that I think about it. Let's just stay with this, though. So um, the, the normal force, or the upwards force, is 
but the force of gravity is still a negative 4.905, okay? So you, I'm just helping you see that you would just do that. You would um, now have those two numbers to make sure I did that right. Yes. So this winds up being, the net force winds up being a negative 0 0.305 newtons. Okay, it's a really small negative force. Um, but that means then if I find the net acceleration, I just have to divide that by 0.5 now. And that's, that's going to give me a negative 0 0.61 meters per second squared. Okay. So I won't, yeah. So, so the down, it says downwards acceleration now, or the net acceleration would be downward at that point. And so um, you actually feel lighter than you actually are. Okay. So let's just carry on. These other two, I think, are just theory. So, it's, so not, now it says at one point during the descent. So this is on the way back down. At one point, the elevator returns to the ground floor. The scale reads, sorry, I wrote over that. The scale reads 5.4 newtons. So at what point in the descent would that occur? Where it like so from the top floor to the bottom floor, where would the scale read 5.4? Where? Okay, at the bottom, be be more specific with that. Okay, as you're hitting the bottom, or as you get to the bottom, then you would the scale would be like, no, we're we're really heavy right now. So you're like, whoa. You can you can you know, you'd feel that if you were on the descent. So it's not at the top. At the top, you wouldn't feel wouldn't see a 5.4. You see something less than 4.905 at the top but at the bottom, okay? So yes, um, essentially we could say something like, uh, well, uh, at, the, at, the, at the bottom, you'd have a greater force up. I was just thinking this in terms of the scale, but I don't have to calculate anything because I can just say near the bottom. This would be near the bottom um, before stopping, okay? So that at that point in the descent, you would experience a greater force up than down, and you'd feel heavier. Okay? So, <laughs> and this last question. Oh, my goodness. Describe a situation where the scale could read zero. <laughs> um, uh, so, no, well, no, sorry. The mass stays on the scale. So, the mass is still on the scale. How could it possibly read zero now? No. Okay, wait, okay, okay, wait, wait, slow down really, really quick in which, like, in which direction, like going up or going down? Because you're right. Okay, going up. Okay, can you, can, you, can you guys imagine that? If you were going up in the elevator and all of a sudden the elevator just like emergency brakes, activate or something, and it goes, and it stops instantly. So if you're in the elevator and it stops instantly, what happens to you? You don't. You, you keep going. You'd be like, whoa. Okay, if the elevator, and there are some brakes actually in an elevator that do that. Okay, so there's one. Okay, if you were going up and then all of a sudden the elevator stopped instantly, you would the, the scale could read zero, even though obviously the, the force of gravity wouldn't change. Okay. Can anyone else think of another scenario? I can think of a couple of scary ones if it would read zero. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there's there's the scary one. So if the cable just got cut and you're like in total free fall, then the scale would be like. No, you don't weigh anything because <laughs> because everything's falling at the rate of 9.81 so like the scale's like yep you read zero it's like uh gee the scale reads zero what's happening <sighs> and then you you know hit the bottom of the elevator shaft but um yeah if you were in total free fall then um the scale could read zero okay so that's a little scary too um and then i had to laugh in here because i think in the in the answer key it said or oh, or the elevator could be in deep space i'm like Willy Wonka, like a great elevator. I don't know if you guys read that story. Um, it's like they, he had this elevator that like would go out into space and everything, everyone's floating in space. And I'm like, I totally thought about that when the key said that. I'm like, okay, I guess. Uh, not really realistic though. So um, anyway, we don't have to necessarily write anything, but as long as you guys kind of thought through that, I want you to be able to visualize that though, because I will ask you a couple of practice questions that address apparent weight. And most of them actually just reference an elevator because that's the easiest way to kind of to, to differentiate between your true weight, which never changes, right? Your true weight is just mass times the gravitational field strength. But your apparent weight can do all, all, all kinds of things, depending on if you're, in a, if you're accelerating or not. 
um, in terms of your frame of reference, okay? So, yeah, whatever. I guess we could put an answer here. Free fall. That would be scary. But anyway, you shouldn't be afraid of riding an elevator. They're crazy safe. There's a whole bunch of safety mechanisms. Most elevators have about five or six cables, not one. And they have like safety brakes and stuff. So I know in movies they show like an elevator falling. That doesn't really happen. Um, but that's just to make you scared. So, uh, yes. So you can just hang on to that. Just put that aside for now. I just want to take about five minutes and go to this page right here. So some of you started. This is the last page, which I do want to work on for the next probably 15, 20 minutes is this. Okay. Um, because it practices, uh, oh, sorry, it's going to practice the gravitational field strength formula, which I, I already boxed in up here, little g. Oh, sorry, it has, an, it has an arrow above it. I should be careful to do that. Um, but essentially how strong uh, gravity is at a point in space. So I want to show you a subtle detail that some of you may have already caught, but if you didn't, um, you can backtrack a little bit. This question plunks an astronaut at a distance above the surface of Earth. Surface of Earth. Okay? So if this is Earth, whatever, this guy is like floating way the heck out here. And yeah, that's totally not to scale, but whatever. <laughs> and uh, it says the distance from the surface of Earth out to him is this 3.2 times 10 to the fourth, but that is kilometers, okay? Okay, fine, we're, we'll, we'll kind of clarify some more distances here in a second, but the point is it wants to know what is the gravitational field strength right there, okay? So what is little g at that location? Yeah, we're gonna use that formula, no surprise. What do you think m1 is gonna be? Any guesses? Actually, I, I guess I should back up for a sec. M1 is a capital M. In the other formula, it's written like this, capital M1, and then it's lowercase m2. What's the difference between M1 and M2? Anybody remember from yesterday? Yes. M1 is the big mass, big M. Yes, see? So yeah, Porter's uh, seeing that right away. The, kind, the, the, the idea is that M2 is the test mass or the small mass. So in this question, the astronaut is the small guy, but big M is the Earth. So when we look at this formula, M1 is going to be the mass of Earth, not the astronaut. But R, this is the one that's a little tricky. R is the separation distance from the center of the big mass to this point in space where the astronaut happens to be. So am I going to grab this number and put it right there? No. What's, what's wrong with that? Ah, yes. So this is technically what we call altitude. You guys are probably familiar with that term. Altitude is a reference from the surface of Earth up. That, this is not the separation distance from the center of the Earth to that location, because there's a whopping distance from the center of the Earth to, that, to, to the surface of Earth. Okay? So yeah, that's definitely the radius of Earth. Uh, I think it's 6.38 times 10 to the 6 meters. Uh, that's listed up here as well. Yeah, there it is right there. All of this stuff is on your planetary data table, which is on your formula sheet too. So just know you can always look it up, but I just happen to have it here. So uh, the only other problem here is this 3.2 times 10 to the fourth kilometers, that's not in meters. So I got to times that by a thousand to get that into meters. So some of you guys know this trick. If you have the exponent uh, times 10 to the fourth, what do you add to that to get it into, into meters? Not six. You got to times this by a thousand because there's a thousand meters in one kilometer. If you're timesing it by the thousand, that's the same as adding three to the exponent. Just a little trick, okay? Because it's three powers of 10. So the point is that this would be um, 
this would actually be 3.20 times 10 to the seventh meters. Okay. But anyway, you just have to get it into meters. So don't, don't uh, just catch the units here. There's obviously little details all over the place. So that's going to give us a, uh, actually, I don't know what that is. I thought I wrote it down here somewhere. Oh, yeah, there we go. It's three point, um, I'm writing this all over the place. So the, the, total, the total distance then, or the total, uh, the total separation distance is going to be, um, yeah, it's 3.838 um, times 10 to the seventh meters. Okay. Um, because this is 6.38 times 10 to the 6th, but I got to add that to 3.2 times 10 to the 7th. So I get a bigger number when I'm done. Now, so to execute then, um, I guess I'll do just this one and let you guys kind of go from here. But this is literally what it looks like. 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton meter squared per kilogram squared times the mass of Earth, which is 5.97 to the, oh dear. Is it the 24th? I don't remember. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. All of that divided by, um, whoops, 3.838 times 10 to the 7th meters. But that big number gets squared. Whew. Okay. So, yeah, entry for sure. You guys are getting really sharp at this because... Um, these are big numbers all the time. Use your um, use your x or your exponent button. I really like that one, so you don't have to uh, um, use brackets all the time. But I'm happy to keep kind of checking in with you guys to see if you're using all the shortcuts just to make your lives easier. Um, okay, seven and that guy is squared. Boom. Yes. So I get, and I'm doing this all at length here because I want you to see the units just once. So out of all that mess, I get 0 0.270, but um, the meters squared is going to cancel with meters squared down here. The kilogram squared is going to cancel one of these kilograms. So one kilogram gets canceled there, and I can cancel the squared on the bottom. And then look what you're left with, newtons over kilograms and that is exactly what you can use for the strength of the gravitational field at that point where the astronaut's located bang okay so point uh 270 so um newtons per kilogram um i can let you answer b and c hopefully those kind of click now but i'll just float around for a bit and see if you're stuck because i know some of you are just seeing this for the first time you didn't see it the other day because you weren't here anyway Let's take like 15, 20 minutes and see if you can get these, okay? And in about, uh, in a little bit, I'll put up the answers, but I think they are already posted on Google Classroom if you want to check them. But um, one of the key details for questions like this is recognizing if I'm describing altitude, don't just think that's the separation distance. You have to add the radius of the planet. In this case, we're adding the radius of Earth, okay? So I'm just going to 